Welcome to the Founders Foyer with me, Ashwarya. This foyer is full of conversations. The space where creators, founders, and builders look for all the concepts and support to grow their ideas into products. What's the best way to unlock creativity? Does our mind have the power to process so many thoughts and references? How does AI help in creating, building, and sharing ideas as founders and creators? Some of these questions are very deep enough, but there's a common line that connects them all the power of cognition and how computers can be trained to augment the science behind. Joining me today is Alice Albrecht, founder of Recollect, an AI-powered thought partner. Alice is one of the experienced and smartest builders in AI. She did a PhD in cognitive neuroscience at Yale and then spent 10 years researching AI before starting up to solve challenges in the human creativity and knowledge space. Hi, Alice. Thank you so much for being here. I'm super excited to begin our conversation today. Hi, yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited as well. Awesome. So from data science to researching machine learning, AI strategy, and to now being a founder, what did you do and how did you get into this flow and what do you look at uh, right now? Yeah, so um, as you mentioned, I originally started off in academia. I was studying cognitive neuroscience. So um, I've always had this like keen interest in understanding human cognition and you know, how we're able to, you know, survive in the world and make all these computations as we walk through it. Um, when I left academia and got into tech, uh, data science was a really nascent field. It was around mm -hmm. 2000. And so we were just starting to see, you know, deep learning come onto the, you know, productionalized playing field, lots and lots of data. Um, so for me as a scientist, it made a lot of sense to move, you know, if I wasn't going to be an academic to a place where I had access to you know, a lot of information, a lot of data around humans, understanding mm. I could do a lot of work in that space and use some of the machine learning skills that I had used, you know, previously as an academic in industry. So they, like, I feel like I sort of grew up with the space of data science and machine learning in tech, um, which was a great experience to see all of the different transitions and as new technologies mm. came out, you know, got better at things um, and we got more data to see how that evolved. And then, um, at the end of that period, I was working with a group called Fast Forward Labs as part of Cloudera, okay. and um, I was spending a lot of my time helping organizations understand what's possible with machine mm -hmm. learning. Um, and at that point, back in, say, 2018-ish, it was a lot about uh, how do we use deep learning? Should we use deep learning? A lot of questions around that. Um, and it was a really exciting time because uh, right around then, a lot of changes started to happen in the field. So we, you know, trans mm. the transform paper came out. Um, we started really unlocking a lot of the capabilities with language. Um, yep. Previously had been a lot of computer vision, a lot of personalization models, a lot of, you know, uh, predictive models to make decisions in businesses. Um, and so for me, I felt like I'd had a good run in uh, working <laughs> for in general. Um, and I was excited to take my passion for human cognition, for augmenting people, and uh, this experience that I'd had and put those together and start my own company. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, for me, what excites about this is that um, how you were able to make a transition from academia into uh, tech right at the time when it was the heart of ML and AI. And like you said, evolution is the kind of word I should say, because I think we are talking right in the week when LLMs and the whole, um, you know, chat GPT has taken such a huge um, um, leap forward uh, this whole week with so many updates. And I'm, I'm glad that from the time that you mentioned is how you worked in 2018, 2019, when Transformer was just brought in and people were just trying to figure out what to do. So where we are, I think there's a lot of learning that went into and a lot of um, little experiments that went into. So I, I'm super excited to be chatting more on how to use this for creativity in front because that's something that I'm equally passionate as well. So yeah. Ah, that's exciting. <laughs> right, yes. And just as we think about the exciting part, right, there's also a lot of creators and founders who struggle with this kind of a memory management because there's like so many things to work on every day. And as a creator myself and as somebody who juggles like a day job, I always think of so many ideas to work on and this endless iteration that we always think about and, and then there's a lot of pressure to ship something. And you're currently working in a space that you term as augmenting creativity. So it's it's super interesting for me to know about this. So can you give the listeners as well a little detail into what you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
And we are talking at a really uh, interesting, you know, time, I guess, uh, with all these announcements this week and all of this focus, I'd say in the last like eight or nine months around how uh, we can use algorithms to generate what, you know, what looks like creative output from these machine learning models. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, choosing things to focus on, I would say like, you know, from my founder perspective, putting that hat on, it is incredibly hard to narrow your focus, to make sure you're trying to choose the right thing. You know, by default, if you're running a startup or thinking about starting a startup, you have very limited resources in terms of mm -hmm. time and energy, in terms of people that can work on this with you. So it's critical for the survival of this uh, as a company to sort of choose a thing and, and kind of focus on that. On the other mm -hmm. hand of that, uh, or the other side of that, rather, um, you know, as somebody who is focused on augmenting creativity, I'm really focused on augmenting creative thought work. And so less on um, augmenting creativity in terms of, you know, output of art or mm. uh, other kinds of creativity that I think people you know, immediately think of when you say, oh, well, someone's very creative. Um, I think there are lots of ways that humans are creative. I think it's oh, really... So it's our it's our superpower. It's our greatest asset. Um, and mm. so for me, that means that's our ability to take two things that are disparate, maybe, um, but interesting mm. to us in connection, put those together and create something in the world with that. Um, so we're sort of always building on ideas we've had or other people have had. Um, but that connection building and then the creation of that and then sharing that information with the world is really that's a huge part of creativity to yep. me. Um, yeah. And so we're really focused on augmenting creative thought work. And so, you know, as a founder, yes, you have to focus a ton. As somebody who's building a product like this, I really encourage people to have all of those ideas to really like write mm. them down and or just give yourself the space and the time because mm. your brain is doing wonderful things during that time. Like that's all really useful. Um, and then at some point it's time to sort of converge on one thing and say, okay, I need to focus on this for a bit, but there's all this other stuff that I know you know, maybe part of this later. Hmm. So like learning to prioritize and, and know what's more important at this point in time. I think that's that's fair enough because um, I, I completely side with you when you say there's like when it's early stage, there's a lot to work on and uh, there's like enough resources to handle. So obviously when it comes to pairing up, it's always strategically moving forward and thinking what's the best one thing that I can focus on right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's, yeah. A, it's a weird because I feel like you have the most open space at the very beginning as you're working on something. There's the most yeah. possibility. And this is to make choice, narrow it a bit. Um, but at the beginning, you also have the least resources usually yep. to work on. Yep. 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 That's very true. Yeah. And there's so many things that I want to touch upon from just what we discussed. I think let's let's take them one by one. First off, um, uh, you, you did clarify the point that it's it's thought work because uh, often when people hear the word creativity, for them it's always like, oh, so that you're into arts or you're uh, you're a painter or you're you're, you're a creative person. But it, it never hits the point that the way we think is also a part of creative pursuit. The, the way we process information, the way we uh, look at something and share those ideas with others is also a form of creativity. So as you're building in this creative uh, augmenting space, what are some challenges that you are, um, you know, going going forward with? And uh, how do you tackle that more from uh, building a tool for creators or knowledge seekers? Yeah. And so I think one of the things that I try to tackle is really even this distinction, right? So we, like I just said, you know, we're not necessarily building for painters, but I think any mm -hmm. kind of creativity. Um, involves this combination of ideas, this combination of, you know, thoughts that you have really at the base of it. And then it's the expression of that. So the expression for me could be writing a blog post, right? Uh, I'm putting my creative ideas together. The expression for somebody else could be creating a piece of visual art that is making a statement, right? Like they have put thought into that. They have connected all these pieces. Like it's beautiful in that sense as well. Um, and so even just at the very beginning, working on something like this, I think, getting clear on what are we actually doing when we augment these things. Um, and, and for me, I'm really trying to get to the place before the output, right? Where you're right. Like putting your right together, you're synthesizing before the generation. And then, you know, in some sense, being generation agnostic, you could have these creative thoughts and put them together and put them out in, you know, any format that makes sense. Um, mm. Yeah. So I think that's one of the, the initial challenges in working in this space. Um, and mm -hmm. I guess, you know, coming back to your question, like, you know, some of the other, like, there are conceptions that we have about productivity, about creativity, all of these pieces. 
that we're, we're playing with recollect at least um that you know people have one way of thinking about this one way that they think you should do your work one way that you know people think you should be productive um and i think we're really trying to push the envelope and say let's reevaluate that especially given <laughs> all of these now. yeah yeah no, there's uh, always the whole um, fantasy around uh, this is how productivity should be defined as, or this is how there's like a cut in, uh, given definition for what um, what kind of activities you do. And often it falls under the umbrella of productivity because I always find this fascination amongst people when it comes to tools, even when it comes to any information or inputs that you process, it's always like, hey, what's the best tool to use for note-taking? Or, you know, what's the best tool to manage your time? What's the best tool to do any little action that you want to do. So uh, hearing this from you around um, uh, zoning in that on, on that one challenge that you want to tackle when it comes to creativity, um, is it just tools? And why do people automatically think in tools and productivity kind of a theme? Is it, is it fundamentally as um, a, a, a kind of a, a inbuilt thing that humans have? Or, um, you know, is, is it a kind of thing that they are grown into? What, what do you think would be the reason that we are always going behind the the kind of tool and uh, what's is, is that the solution in the creativity space that's a great question um i think it has a couple of pieces one is you know to answer the is it that we have this uh sort of ingrained or you know not i wouldn't say innate i wouldn't go that far but like we have this ingrained want to have these tools or is it that these tools were built and we're using them because they were built and we, we've been taught that that's how you do this creative thinking right um so to take that question right i think that Everybody innately goes through this process where they're putting their ideas together. Everybody mm -hmm. is creative. I really do believe that. Um, and it's a hasty process we don't have a ton of access to. So if you think about people have like creative shower thoughts or they have, uh, you know, they're on a walk and this, this great idea comes to them or someone says something and it sparks this, uh, you know, new idea. Um, those processes are not ones we largely can control. So they happen. It's a lot of background work that your mind is doing to, to put these things together. Um, it makes sense as humans that we would want to have tools to communicate that work. And I think that's where some of the productivity pieces start. If we go back to like a notebook or, or writing or putting our ideas somewhere, right? Like, and that's to me, the, like the first tool of productivity is pen and mm -hmm. paper. Can we ex externalize our thinking? Can we share that with somebody else? Um, and then from that, when we have, you know, then we have filing cabinets to organize all those papers because that's important. We don't want to lose all the papers that we have. Um, yeah. And then, you know, there's things like the chalkboard originally or like any kind of place to draw images. I think that's really important to some of these productivity tools. All of that got digitized when we have computers. So as soon as everyone was on, you know, on a computer, not even necessarily online, we started to replicate the typewriter, the filing cabinets. Um, to some extent, the whiteboard, if you think of like MS Paint, you know, way back when. Um, and so a lot of the tools have mimicked the physical tools that we had before. Mm. Uh, and that shapes the way we think. So obviously, as a child, when you're growing up in a society that does have computers now, and I, you know, was sort of on the cusp of that as a kid, um, that changes the way you're thinking. So we have this innate ability to put these ideas together. We have the desire to communicate them with other people, to express them. Um, and then the way we think about productivity then is really informed by, oh, there are tools that help me do this, but mm. unfortunately, I think it narrows thinking around it, right? So if, if someone hands you a tool, you don't have to go through the work of inventing a tool on your own. So that's great. Um, but you lose some of that space of like, what's possible with tools then? Um, cause, cause there's this kind of good enough answer. So people identify with these tools also, like, you know, some people will say, you know, I love Apple Notes. I, you know, yeah. they get Apple, whatever tool they're using because it does help them to unlock something that they want to find. Um, but I think it's a combination to sort of answer mm. the question you asked about, right? You've got this innate ability and, or, you know, ingrained ability rather and want to do this. And then you have the tools that have already been created that seem obvious. Yeah, yeah. That's that's a well put uh, answer, I should say, because like you said, it's it's always trying to create a sort of form to whatever we're thinking. So I think uh, uh, when pen and paper helped you do that, the digital tools then became a, a sort of way for them to uh, just level up from what they did with pen and paper to do something a little more visually aligned, a little more beautiful than what they themselves do. So these tools enable them to bring whatever they think in a much better fashion 
something that we never discovered ourselves in the first place when uh, we struggled with pen and paper or, you know, often people have this, just give me a blank paper or what am I supposed to do with this? But, you know, when there are like these blogs, when there are these tools that help you uh, take a, a guided up. And then you, you kind of feel that, oh, this is what that's really been running in their mind. I, I just didn't know so far. So uh, I think the fact that it gives form to whatever you're thinking and, um, you know, that's, that's definitely one way uh, people fall in love with tools or like they just internalize that a little too much. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I agree. Right. Right. Yeah. So, but one of the things that I also see with using these tools is uh, the fact that the kind of attention that we as humans have and, and the kind of focus that we take on most of this work uh, is becoming very minimal. So uh, getting to that sort of creative flow is something that all of us miss because that's becoming like an expensive activity right now with both work and personal funds. And often people say that, oh, you know, it's, it's important to get into a creative flow to achieve something. Why do you think we lost uh, our whole focus around in this attention span that we have now? And and how, what what do we do to get back to that creative flow that people talk about? Yeah. And so I like part of my original academic work was actually setting attention. So I care a lot about this space. Um, not mm -hmm. the kind of attention we're talking about necessarily, more visual attention. But, um, you know, I think one thing is our attention spans feel much shorter. I think that if all of our electricity went off tomorrow, our mm -hmm. attention spans, as they always were, we would be fine. Um, but it's rather that we have the stimulus, we have these apps, we have this access to information um, that we didn't have before. And so, you know, again, computers come around, people start networking the computers, we start to digitize everything in the world that we can, all this information. That's amazing. That was a dream for so long. Um, mm -hmm. But with that comes a world that we can't actually navigate. We didn't evolve to cope with this. So um, you know, without these machines, there's no way I would have access to, you know, something somebody wrote halfway across the world 45 years ago. Like I would never have encountered it. So there's again, like a good and bad to that. So like amazing that all this information is accessible or becoming more accessible at least. Um, but we can't cope with it. So I think what happens is people's, uh, you know, they feel overwhelmed and we get into this cycle of, well, it's a lot of information. And then something else comes along, a piece of software to try to help us to either decrease that information. So like mm -hmm. tweets have, those are like a nice example to pull on like very short representations of, you know, instead of a book or a blog post, you can read a tweet. Um, so these, the information gets smaller so that it's easier to cope with. And then we rely on these algorithms or companies that design the algorithms rather to curate that for us and say like, I can't possibly navigate. The first example mm -hmm. of that is right? like Google search starts to put, you know, information in an interesting way together to say, like, give me the world information, but I want what's relevant right now. So as mm. soon as we step off that train, we're then, you know, with, you know, there's advertising models are to blame to some extent, but we're on a train where the objective is smaller amounts of information, highly curated or designed to work for me. Um, and then people like that. So we get into, again, people are like, wow, this is great. But I think where we kind of, took a misstep with this attention economy is like then doing it over and over and over again, right? So then we're doing yeah. 80 or 90% of our time is consuming. We're never in a creative flow state then unless, yeah. you know, part of a creative state is the consumption. You have to consume, you have to talk to people, you have to like workshop these ideas um, mm -hmm. or whatever. But, and you need a lot of input. So that's an important part of the process, but it's not the only one. And if we get caught in that, like, it's so easy now. You've made it so easy with, like, small content, <laughs> algorithmic lady, you know, like, gives me what I need. Um, yeah. People don't do the blank canvas, deep yeah. thought work. Um, and so I think that's, yeah, I, I'm worried about that in terms of, you know, societally. Um, yeah. So for us, I think a lot about from the cognitive science perspective, what is creative, where, what is creativity, what is actually a creative flow state? Um, and so pieces of that are that, you know, you have your materials ready. So that's the, like, I got the information I needed. I, you know, I fought through information overwhelm. I've got some materials to build with. Um, you need to be able to connect to those ideas. So you mm -hmm. need to be able to like make the associations. That's some of the work that happens behind the scenes when you're walking, when you're doing something else, 
this information is all getting connected because that's how your brain allows yeah. you to deal with it. Um, and then you have to be in a reasonable affective state, which I think is what people don't talk about a ton is like, you can't be, I mean, you can be depressed. There's lots of really brilliant people who are very depressed uh, and, you know, very creative in their thinking. Um, but if you are in a state where you're not, your mood is really low, um, it's not great for your creative flow state. So you kind of want to get yourself into a state where you're not super stressed out about the news. You're not like, you know, you're not, you haven't been entrained for 45 minutes down like some rabbit hole somewhere else. And then the last piece is you'll have to let your mind wander. And so I think the attention economy did us a disservice also because Absolutely. it's keeping us in that hyper-focused state. We're not distracted, um, but we actually need to be more distracted. We need to like let our mind <laughs> wander around that space to put these things together. Absolutely. The last po point of this, I think I would I would definitely give you a high fare there because I feel like we, um, uh, it's, it's a very controversial take to kind of say that wandering and, and, and that kind of a distraction is very much needed for us to get back to focus. But uh, you're, um, uh, you're right in saying that we just get super hyper-focused that we just don't get out of our phones or gadgets that we like really look into and, and that cast us to a state where we, we learn not to disconnect. There's, there's no sort of disconnect for us with what we're thinking. And uh, it's often not the kind of focused thinking like you mentioned. It's it's not thinking about, okay, so uh, I want to search for this. So let me just go put this up and let me just try to uh, see what I've got is like getting back to the question that I had in mind. And yes, I've done it. It's never stopping at that stage, right? It, it's The algorithm is kind of just looping you in as you keep scrolling through. And that often takes you to a state where um, you stop processing what you focus on. So um, I think you brought in the right points there when you try to explain this. Yeah. And then like the tiny caveat I'll add is some of that is great, right? We need this ability to discover new information. So it's not bad whole cloth to say, you know, don't go on Twitter, don't go on anything that's mm -hmm. giving you information, right? Like that is good, but then understanding when you're done and like being yeah. intentional, I think is just yeah. a human for yourselves to do. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a little practice that we have to consciously start taking towards because um, we we have, uh, uh, like you said, we've gone to a point where this wouldn't stop unless we take a conscious step uh, to focus and, and sort of to course correct there. So uh, yeah, definitely requires a little bit of an effort from our side. And, you know, drawing parallel to what we were just discussing with a lot of these updates that's been happening in the generative AI space and, and a lot of these LLMs being used for chat GPT and with the recent Bing updates and all of that. One thing that sounds very promising to me, like I know uh, just as a threat that you were just talking about in terms of people like summarizing things, people always look for things that are given to them in chunks. But one uh, positive thing that I see with a lot of these updates uh, made in uh, the LLM space is the fact that even though we're still going to get a summarized version, uh, a lot of the prompt that goes into it is basically you having to put that time and effort. If, if you're just going to put something that's just very... Um, you know, half thought there, the kind of answer you're going to get summarized is also going to be the same. So I feel like the flow or the thought work you put in there is going to be very specific to what you want to search for and what's there in your mind. And I guess those kind of searches are going to take more time for you. But at the same time, you get into a sort of digital flow in that way, I feel. So even though the summary is what you get as an answer, I feel like you can still achieve a state of flow there. That's a great point. Um, uh... So I think that underlying that too is that we're still doing the work, the thought work, the creative work to come up with these prompts, right? So it's the same as if someone handed you a computer that had no software on it, just sort of a DOS prompt or something, right? Exactly. You're not, yeah. So if I, if I just start typing random things, okay. But <laughs> it really requires us to use this as a tool, as a way to say, I had the idea, put the idea together, and the prompting, and I, and I I do have to say that I think the prompting as it is right now will probably go away. Like we'll have another way of interacting. Um, and I see the language models as having sort of functional language that we can communicate with the machines in a better way, maybe. Um, but we're still telling something. We're still saying something to the machine. Um, yeah. And so you have to have that thought before you put it to the machine. And then the machine will do something with it. If you want to summarize it, great. Right. I think there's nothing wrong with summarizing information. It helps people to deal with, wow, there's way too much stuff out here. Um, yeah. But but yeah, I think we'll continue to see that 
we actually, it takes a lot of effort and it takes a lot of time. So the flow state piece is very interesting because it's possible that with less friction there, right? Where you're trying to talk to the machine, you want it to do something. Um, you're trying to move your thinking forward. If we reduce that mm -hmm. friction, use all our language models by summarizing, by, you know, helping us get unstuck if we're got writer's block, something like that. Um, mm -hmm. It does actually in that flow state. It's not distracting in that sense. Um, mm -hmm. If the chatbot starts doing something, you know, where it's jumping in and recommending things all the time. Yeah, then get yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, on, on that side, I feel like it's very promising to see a lot of these um, uh, new age tech and, and the way people receive to it. I think it's going to, uh, time is going to tell us how it gets received, but uh, uh, completely with you on that in terms of um, just, just excited to see where it goes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So Alice, one more question on neuroscience, just because like we're trying to uncover a lot of truths around it. You've done extensive study on cognitive neuroscience and you've worked in the past with all kind of uh, AI research and, and um, training these machine learning algorithms. So could you break down some actionable steps for us in terms of unlocking creativity? Because we spoke about how um, depression, getting too much hyper-focused, all of this can stand in the flow of uh, getting our creative thoughts out. So how would you say one can unlock creativity, especially as a founder and builder at this uh, current stage of tech? Yeah. Um, and to me, it's interesting. So the product that we've ended up building this AI powered out partner in part helps me do my work as a founder, right? Like a lot of it is focused on getting us into this creative flow state. Um, mm -hmm. And so, I mean, for actionable tips, I think that being intentional about what you're consuming, how much time you're spending consuming is good on both ends. So you don't want to be so hyper-focused on building that you don't know that chat GPT was released, right? Like you want to be aware of the world. You want to be communicating with other people. These new ideas are really exciting um, in all kinds of spaces, not just in the machine learning space. Um, so I think that, you know, making sure you're consuming information, but being intentional about that consumption. The next piece mm -hmm. is, you know, creating this space to do that work. So um, I think as a founder, especially, and I know that's a lot of the audience for this podcast, you know, you need to block some time. It's so easy to say next week, oh, this thing came up, something happened with our back end or front end, like I can't <laughs> right now. Um, but, you know, ultimately it's a mixture of execution and strategy and the strategy yeah. piece, the creative piece it's not going to happen if you don't make the space for it. So I think, you know, making the space, however that works for people to do that, like blocking calendar, things like that. Um, and then on in terms of boosting creativity, so once you have some materials you've gathered, you've got a space that makes sense. Um, playing with connecting those ideas all the time is another thing that I think is important. So like, even as you're reading, start to write down, like, what does this mean for me? What How is this connected to something else I know? Starting mm. even at very beginning consumption stages of connecting those and that piece those pieces of information that'll boost creativity and then humans are incredibly helpful for for like boosting each other's creativity um so even this conversation you and i are talking about uh you know the same subjects but you have a bunch of information in your mind um, and in your knowledge that's important mm. and in perspective and from mine and so uh, people, when they talk with other humans and work with them, they can boost their creativity that way. So they start to form these connections and they start to see things from another perspective. That's really impossible if you're on your own. If you're just, you know, on a desert island and you've got your whiteboard, like, and the books, like you will have creative thoughts. Um, you might go, you know, insane otherwise being alone. But um, I think I encourage people to like go for a walk, get some space away from the thing that they're working on to let all that stuff cohere and connect for them, but then talk to friends, talk to other founders, talk mm -hmm. to your community, talk to your family, whoever it is. Um, and you'll be amazed at how much that groundwork of, you know, consuming, connecting your own thoughts together and then sharing that and getting feedback back and forth will push your ideas too. Right. So many actionable points, I should say. And all of them, uh, uh, the, the part that I'm uh, uh, loving about this is that all of them are very executable at a day-to-day -day basis. So it's like those little practices that we can start incorporating in, in just your everyday work cycle. And it's something that would grow on to you and more like it becomes a autopilot mode once you start getting accustomed to it. So that, that makes a lot of sense. And it also sounds like a lot of, um, you know, uh, internal and external presence. 
cogni cognition, not just in terms of thinking, but like you said, using other people's inputs, using them as a sounding board, like trying to go and talk to them and, and just discuss with them about anything that's just running in your mind. So it requires that sort of dual nature where you have to be present um, within yourself as well and also with the yeah, environment right. that's out. So you, you just need to know when to switch between both of these because at times you want your solitude to work on these, but at times you want to just go put yourself out there. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, it, it, it's fun to figure those things out. There's no right answer either. So it's not like, there's no prescription for like spend 20% cool. of your time. Um, but, but yeah, I think that, you know, as a founder, especially, you know, we're building a really early stage product, like yeah, the more we hear from our customers, the more we hear from other people, like that changes so much in the way that I'm thinking about the product and the way the team is like um, that, it's it's really fascinating to me to see the fruits of those activities, like those little intentional steps. You see an automatic benefit. Like you'll have, I, I almost guarantee if you do some of these things, you'll have an idea and you'll say like, wow, I wouldn't have had that otherwise. And reflecting on that, like if I hadn't done this thing, would I have had this experience? Probably not. So that it reinforces that behavior for you if it's a positive one. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So as we talk about a lot of this um, societal part into uh, uh, playing a, a large role in what we do uh, as, as a founder or a builder, uh, I would also like to switch gears towards what you're currently building with Tricolin. I, I uh, was very excited seeing this part called Design with Mind in Mind on your website. And I was super curious because for me, it sounded like you're taking a product building approach that is so much aligned with users' consciousness there. And this is a sort of strong opinion, right? When it comes to uh, building something, especially in very early stage. So what are some of your product building purposes? And let's say sometimes it could contradict with what's existing norms in, in, in uh, the community outside. So uh, what, why do you think it's important to keep users' attention, which you said was your major focus area, and this sort of consciousness into mind while building products? Yeah, yeah. And it is a really strong, I mean, I am, this is a strong bet I'm making. So it's not for everybody. Um, and the bet for me is that, you know, if we're working with a lot of machine learning models in our product. And so mm -hmm. in that, if we are developing those machine learning models and the product as a whole, um, based on what I understand about human cognition, which is quite a lot, um, and the research that's coming out, um, that's one way of designing with your mind in mind, right? So understanding somewhat how the mind works. We don't understand consciousness almost to any degree right now. So we don't, we can't model consciousness in any of these uh, processes. We understand a bit about attention, a bit about memory, um, a bit about creativity. Um, and so taking the principles and what we know about, you know, both behaviorally and from the neuroscience perspective um, and using those really to inform the way we design our product and we, do, we design the models is really important to me. And my big bet here is that if we do that, we end up with a product that's more aligned with humans and the way they interact with the world and the way they interact with this technology. So um, if we do that, we will circumvent a lot of the trouble with, I've created this thing, but people can't understand it. It doesn't really work for them. It's causing you know, distress or it's causing them to be you know, uh, entrained in this way. Um, and so that's a big piece for me. And then mm -hmm. on the other side, um, you know, for decades now, I've spent a lot of time either explicitly doing research with humans uh, when I was an academic and, you know, bringing them into the lab and learning from them um, or, you know, in various product machine learning data roles, uh, learning from customers and taking that approach of, okay, let's really understand, let's get into what's happening with this person, what's their workflow, um, being able to do that in a systematic way, I think is really important. I think a lot of different roles and you know experiences can give you that. Um, but that's really the other piece uh, for us and sort of the mind in mind. But I think the major one, the major bet I'm making is if we design um, products, especially machine learning based products that are based on um, actual principles of how your mind works, we're gonna end up with a better output and especially if you're working in any augmented cognition that changes and works with your thinking. Yeah, I mean, it's like it's like saying that the human mind is already messy. So let this tool not make it even messier. <laughs> Let's just sort of try to you know bring a balance into the way humans think. I think it's it's uh, really good to know that. And uh, what makes me more um, intriguing here is is that. Uh, 
you must have seen a lot of panels like let's say when you were back in academia you had um, a lot of these experiments running especially when you did your doctorate you would have had a lot of these people coming in you would have observed the kind of uh, interactions that they make with certain experiments and then you would have arrived at certain hypotheses and uh, you know kind of written narratives based on that and fast forward to what you're doing with being a founder a lot of this is very similar because you use the feedback mechanism you use what your early customers say about this uh, so do you think there's like a lot of parallels between both of these or what's generally been your observation with with what you did in academia and what you did uh, what you're currently doing with being in uh, the foundation yeah, there are a lot of parallels. So, you know, bringing people into a, into the lab and doing research, you know, with them and trying to understand their thinking um, really does set you up if you go, anybody out there who's making a transition or has made a transition from academia in those spaces to tech, mm -hmm. um, it really sets you up with a strong foundation for understanding how to ask questions. Um, the hypotheses always come first. So you don't run an experiment unless you have the hypothesis. Um, there's nothing to run. It takes a lot of effort to bring people in and recruit them and all of these things. So you mm -hmm. want to get as close to as, you know, as possible to the right hypothesis. To get to that hypothesis, you have to have a theory that's you know out there. So you're interacting with other academics and their literature and the things they're publishing and the things they're saying. So you're developing this theory all the time. I think it's really similar in building products. You have a theory of the world. You have a theory of how you know the world is changing right now. Um, and your job as a founder is to predict you know, even if you're not a founder, even if you're on any kind of tech team, you have to be predicting where things are going. So yeah. this theory, theory gets updated and then you have a hypothesis. You think, oh, if I, I think this feature will help like oh, us to, you know, get to this objective that we have as a company. And so that's a hypothesis, whether you co-traders that or not, you're testing something. Um, and like, even, you know, 10 years ago, A-B testing became this huge thing. People were like, we're going to A-B test everything. It's going to be amazing. Yeah. Um, it's not completely necessary. If you have an intuition, you know some things about the world. You don't need to start from scratch every time. Um, mm -hmm. But those things have carried over. And I think the big difference for me, because right now, you know, I'm reaching from, I have a theory of how things work. I'm reaching into academia a lot. I still read a lot of the papers and understand what the th existing theories are. Um, I am, you know, building models, testing hypotheses, with, you know, with customers now and seeing like, is this, does this validate this? Does this change my theory? Mm. But in tech, in building products in this way, it is fundamentally different from research because I'm not trying necessarily to add to a scientific body of research, right? right? Like I'm not publishing papers. Um, I'm also not looking for the exact truth. I'm looking for kind of good enough that this yeah. changes people. It's, it's the application of some of these things um, hmm. which is where I love to sit now. I think the last several years, even before I started this, I was doing a lot of applied machine learning work. So taking machine learning research, seeing how we can apply that, seeing what actually happens in the real world. Um, it's fascinating to me to test those theories in a kind of a different way than in the lab. Yeah, no, it definitely is fascinating. You know, for a lo long time, uh, I, I still have this as a uh, as a fantasy kind of thing. I've always wanted to appear for like a test when it comes to um, somebody doing a research, and I've always wanted to go there appear as as a person who's there for test. So, like when you explain about this, I'm like, oh no, I I really wish I I was I was there to help you with one of those um, you know hypotheses that you were trying to probe through. Uh, so um, you know that's that's something that always fascinated me. And I I liked how you mentioned about drawing the line because I think when doing a research, um, you're trying to corroborate to a certain thing but I think when you're trying to build product you're not trying to go to the absolute truth or like trying to do something to prove a certain aspect of it but a lot of discoveries come through as you're just trying to figure out whether it's reading a paper or whether it's trying to find um, something from your early customers so the fact that you don't always go behind corroborating something but you're trying to use that new piece of information to maybe um, shift gears or like try to uh, slightly navigate and, and arrive at a, a different learning is, is uh, definitely one interesting part of this. Yeah, and it's where I think science and engineering kind of overlap in tech. So, you know, in the big ideal of academia or, or any kind of research, really, where you're pushing those, even if you're at a tech company, you're doing pure research, um, you're actually meant to disprove things. And I know that gets really mm -hmm. lost. I mean, it really feels like, yes, absolutely, you want your study to do, to do something great. You want to publish a paper. You want to, like, move that forward. Um <laughs> For instance, you know, in, in science, you're trying to get to this like very high threshold, trying to disprove something, some theory, so that you learn something more about the world. Um, yeah. And 
in tech and like in building products specifically, you're building a bridge between research and engineering. So you're you're, you're using these principles to build stuff. You're saying, mm-hmm. okay, great. And say this is pretty true about from these theories, from these papers, from these studies. Let's apply that and see like what does that do now? Like now that mm-hmm. we have this knowledge and we know this right. thing now. Um, yeah. And then right, it's it's not about oh, it definitely disproves this because you're not nothing's controlled about yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, no, yeah, very true. It it kind of gives you the playground effect where you feel like let's let's just like chase after each of these and then just see if one ties into the other. And it's 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 all like a gameplay at the end of the day. Yeah. I yeah. Still, if you want to participate in a study, like it's it's a lot of fun. <laughs> Universities oh, always have people that are hurting. Um yeah. <laughs> absolutely yeah yeah it's so much fun and um I don't know it's always been like a fancy thing for me to do it's like how people ask what really excites you and I think this is definitely one of the things that excites me to to just like sometimes I just used to wonder okay I just want to know the way I think like how my brain works I I would love for somebody to do like a study and I would like to appear for that and it just gives me like a little goosebump effect whenever I think about it but yeah that's just one of those things that fancy me it's amazing <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so um oh wait I, I have now that you spoke all of this I, I have to ask you this question do you have any concepts or theories that you've been fascinated by with all of the research that you did with neuroscience anything particularly comes to your mind yeah I mean for me a lot of the academic research I did was really focused on what we called statistical summary representations which just means mm-hmm. things from the world kind of boiling those down so that your minds can work with them. So I am really still fascinated by this idea of information reduction so that your mind can work. Like, how do we even navigate the world at all, given the amount of information that comes in through our eyes, Mm -hmm. ears, all of our sensory information? Um, So I would say, like, I'm still fascinated by that space. Um, And then kind of adjacent to that, um, I, over the years, have become increasingly interested in this idea of how we form concepts. So how do we have a concept of anything, especially something that's not visual? So like an apple is a concept. Uh, It's also an object. Um, So non-object concepts are really fascinating to me. I think that Mm. there's ways to think about, uh, you know, from, and and this bridges machine learning, it bridges cognitive science, it bridges neuroscience to some extent, but like information's coming in, we're updating our representation of a concept. Each of us has a different representation of a concept and there's no like obvious place for our concept of like, you know, geopolitical conversations, right? That's a concept for us, but like there's no place in the brain, you know, where it says like, this is where you encode that. Um, So I think for me, I will continue to be fascinated by the idea that everybody has a different kind of conceptual landscape in a sense. They all have concepts. How do those form? Why? Um, And then how do we communicate those with each other? So if I have a concept of something and you have a concept of something, they have so much behind them that's different. Um, but with language, we're able to meet in the middle somewhere, even if we can't express everything that underlies that concept, all of the data that went into that. Yeah, beautifully put. And adding on to that, I would say uh, when you try to bring in concepts and uh, uh, relate, you know, two sides of thinking with uh, uh, together, there's also patterns that, let's say, you wouldn't have discovered, but you found that in another person's thinking so uh for me i've always been excited about that patterns that you can extract uh which sometimes is not very evident when you look at it in the first place but um as you slowly start thinking about it the kind of patterns you can extract from both your own thinking and other person's thinking is is really um you know excellent in, in terms of learning new things yes and it's one of the primary ways we learn is from other people and and really uh understanding how we have this this bridge between people and then you know, we learn new things from those people in that way. Those patterns are really important. Um, and then revisiting those patterns at the right time. So so I could have learned something 10 years ago that like I sort hmm. of understood. And then now I have this knowledge for, you know, 10 more years of data if we just reduce it. Um, but, you know, my internal landscape has changed. The person's internal landscape has changed. If we revisit that, it's a totally different thing, which also fascinates me. Um, yeah. That yeah. connection point is very different. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so with a lot of this uh, research stuff that we talk about with both machine learning and AI, 
it also comes with the responsible part of it, which is to always have uh, the ethical uh, portion of it covered with any tech advancement that we have. So what are your thoughts around this? Because we spoke about both uh, academic kind of uh, uh, experiments to run as well as uh, what has been happening so far with uh, uh, the elements and, and uh, the stuff that you're working on as well with a lot of machine learning involved in uh, Recollect. So where do you see this space transitioning towards and how important do you think um, ethical tech uh, is in, in this context? Um, I think the ethical tech is probably actually more important than the tech itself. Um, I see the tech part of it. If we say, let's take LLMs for an example, there's lots of, you know, we've been talking about this in the machine learning space for a very long time now. So I don't want to uh, sort of <laughs> sidestep all that conversation. And it's almost, this, it, it's a similar conversation, right? When we were thinking about, um, this is a technology in and of itself, it is not human, um, but given that it's trained on a lot of data to predict things and it's not a deterministic system. So we can't put one thing out and know we're going to get the same thing every time usually. Um, so with those two pieces, the information we put in is incredibly important. So whatever training data goes into these needs to be a diverse set of training data that mm -hmm. people are, you know, a diverse set of people have a perspective on. And I think we've gotten into trouble many times with this already. We will continue to get into trouble with it where we're taking like a very sort of, uh, you know, whatever words you want to use, but like a very Western, a very sort of like American centric. For some not of these representative, models. not very representative. They're not, at all. They're not at all. And the types of data we're bringing in, right? So we're able to access all this information we did in times. That's fantastic. Um, it's a particular type of data. It's not mm -hmm. necessarily representative of humans. And so like our conversation right now, maybe that gets transcribed and this will be in a model someday. Um, <laughs> but we need a diversity of uh, representation in terms of people building, in terms of the data that goes in. And then we need a diverse diverse kinds of data. Um, so mm -hmm. not just Reddit, um, which I know people like to pick on, but um, so I think that's, that's a huge concern. Um, and then the other piece of the ethical, you know, in, in deploying these things. So we have um, a system that we're feeding it data intentionally. What kind of data are we feeding it? And then it's a, not a deterministic system. So we don't know why the outputs happen mm. sometimes. We don't know necessarily how to control them. If you've tried these prompts, you can really attest to that, that it's like a black box. You're shooting a prompt in, you get something out, you try again. Yeah. Um, and so in that sense, I think we really need to focus on um, you know, all of this can be used for good. All of it can be used for really bad, right? So right. there's a double sword to every single part of this. And the people that take this tool, which is really just software at the end of the day, right? Like it's fancy mm. software, with software. They can use it in different different ways. Um, I mean, this is huge piece of OpenAI's argument for not to, like dumping these models. And I can see both sides from, you know, stability AI and OpenAI, and there's this debate going on. Um, I think that getting it to people that, you know, can getting more people to be able to use the thing is really important because then we don't mm. narrow all of that power. But also thinking about if this tool exists, what else needs to exist? What kinds of other right. tools do we have um, to prevent, you know, there's a lot of conversation around deep fakes, which we've mm. had before with we yeah. have these you know, algorithms. Um, but you know, there's gotta be a parallel journey for people that are very passionate about this space and thinking mm -hmm. about what is the worst thing someone could do with this the absolute right. worst and starting to mitigate that now before mm -hmm. it goes mm -hmm. out um and that i think we have an ethical obligation to do when putting this technology into the world um and really thinking hard and not getting so excited about this new development that we forget oh yeah okay so yeah every human gets this what happens yeah like we have societal problems already those will be amplified and, and, and in ways we can't direct if it's not deterministic, really. Um, wow. So yeah, it's it's important. Um, I think, unfortunately, like I have, you know, always thought about and, uh, you know, in any kind of work that I've done really put some angle on the ethical implications of anything we're building. How do we collect the data? Are we paying the people to label the data correctly? Like all of these things need to come into play. Um, mm -hmm. But I think a lot of people can shy away from doing the work because they feel like it's insurmountable to deal with these ethical problems. Um, 
or you get people like a, a certain group of people gets really focused on the ethical problems. Like if you look at the right. people doing ethical research, like those people should also be doing the building. Those people should mm. also really be pushing the algorithms forward and putting the perspective there. Um, and so anyway, for anyone listening to this in this space is like, <laughs> I encourage you to build the algorithms. I encourage you to think really, to, like tackle those hard problems about the ethical piece. Um, right. But the voice is really needed in both spaces. Yeah. Not- I mean, do do both of these synchronously, right? Just as you said, don't always try to you know, get this towards the end. Don't always build the algorithm and then think about, okay, wait, did I actually do this in an ethical way? And that's going to cost you a lot. So uh, in terms of both, uh, you know, the resources that you spend it and also uh, the thought that went into doing this. So uh, yeah. it sounds not like doing it both synchronously and then, yeah, and then like trying to always not keep it as an afterthought, but yeah, just try to uh, do like a, you know, what what often product managers call as um, uh, pre-mortem. Like just think about what is the worst thing that would happen if this is going to go live and then just go address all of those one by one. Yeah, or be aware of them, even if you can't fix them, right? It's still right, going to go right, live. Right. Else with like fewer ethical considerations is going to make it go live. So if you feel like you see ethical issues with it, voice those, understand them, get other people involved, but don't shy away from doing it because really a lot of this stuff will happen. And like, I want to have more people that are thinking from a diverse set of perspectives about the ethical implications, building this stuff as much as we can. Right, right, right. Certainly, yeah. And and that's definitely a great point to all of those who are listening in terms of just get excited about the space at the same time, understand the implications that could come with uh, every transformative approach that you're going to be having uh, from uh, in our time starting now. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome, Alice. Oh my God, this is such a fantastic session in terms of learning so many things about the way we think. Uh, and, and you know, just, just the fact that creativity can entail a lot of uh, concepts, not just uh, being artistic or not just sticking to one realm of it. So thank you so much, Alice. It's uh, been an eye-opening session for me and I'm pretty sure it's the same for the listeners as well. And uh, all the best with Recollect. I'm super excited to see what you're going to be shipping out and, and uh, just waiting to try my hands on it. Amazing. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. It's been amazing. Awesome. Thank you, Alice.